Okay, here we go, Allie. So, Allie, it's really nice for you to join me today. Oh, um, thank you for, for asking me. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. And I'm really excited um, because we have a little um, added excitement to our adventure, which we'll share with everybody in a little bit. Um, but tell us a little bit. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is, you know, we're, we're doing the uh, get, getting to know your neighborhood series and and we've done two prior and you helped me on the last one as well with Cornell to write up his um, his little storyline. So um, thank you so much for helping me with that. That was that was awesome. That was awesome. So. All right. So let's start out with telling us a little bit about your history, like where you grew up and then you could share a little bit about your husband and how you met. And so tell us a little bit about your your history. You don't mind. Sure. Um, so I grew up um, on Long Island uh, in a town called Rockville Center. Um, my parents are still there. So I get to, I mean, pre-pandemic, I got to go visit, but um, they're still there. Um, I grew up, I'm the oldest of two. I have one younger sister. Um, she's seven years younger than me. Um, and uh, I went to Mount Holyoke College, which is a teeny tiny uh, women's college in South Hadley, Massachusetts. So the Western part of the state. Uh, I majored in English. I've always been a writer. Um, I went in thinking that I would go to college and then uh, write the next, you know, great American novel. And, um, and I wound up really falling in love with journalism while I was there. So I wound up editing our college newspaper. And when I graduated, I started looking into internships in that field. Um, I graduated in 2008. So obviously, you know, print's still around, but video and TV journalism was becoming, um, you know, more and more ubiquitous. Uh, so I wound up taking a job um, for a news organization. And after I'd been there a year or so, um, there was an opening for their documentary unit, which I thought just sounded, I've always loved documentaries and it just sounded really fascinating. Um, and so I wound up becoming an associate producer uh, for the documentary unit. And so I learned um, how to tell long form stories, which I'd been doing, you know, I'd always written sort of like longer fiction and things like that, but this was like long form journalism, which I really, really fell in love with. Wow. So and, what is that? Like explain to me in detail, not in detail, but explain a little bit more about that because that, that, I guess it's not, you know, you're a writer, but what do you do with that particular class of writing? So those are really the stories, um, they were news documentaries, so they're sort of an hour long usually. Um, they aired on the news channel, but they got to take one story and really explore it in detail. So to do that, um, first you have to find the people to tell the story because the story is important, of course, but it's also firsthand account. So the people who are gonna tell the stories really becomes very important. Um, so it's finding those people and then building a relationship with them, really, because it's, I'm imagining it's very disorienting to get a phone call out of the blue and it's someone you don't know and they want to put you and your story on TV. And so you kind of have to take that process a little bit slowly, um, get to know them, get to know their story. And then, um, you know, over the course of talking with them, kind of get them to agree to an interview um, and then figure out. Interviews are funny, which I'm sure you know, too, where it's, you know, you'll get a totally different answer to a question, you know, depending on the order sometimes. Um, and an interview is really telling a story. So it's not just the final product that's a story, but the interview itself kind of tells a story, the way you ask questions, the order you ask the questions in. Um, so crafting that interview and then... Um, most of the interviews we did were on tape, like this one. Um, so, yeah, so you um, can edit it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we'd end up with hours of footage and, you know, you have to kind of whittle that down and write a script um, that, you know, condenses it into however long the story was going to be. So sometimes an interview would be incorporated into a seven minute segment or sometimes a bit longer. It kind of depended on the story and what we were doing. Um, so I learned how to find those people, craft those interviews, do those interviews. Um, right. so, you know, we did politics, but we also did, um, we would do like breaking news events every once in a while. We would take a breaking news story and we would really go in detail and figure out what's the history of this. Um, you know, who are the key players? What's the, sort of the past, present, future of the story? And so you really get to live with a story for a long time. Um, we did profiles of people. We did profiles in different places. Um, one of the most interesting stories I got to do was we profiled, um, I forget what year it was, but it was an election year. And 
we went to a couple of down ballot races and we followed, I think, six of them um, at different points. So we, we covered these different races at the beginning of the campaign, the middle of the campaign, and then the end of the campaign to election day. And we did both candidates. We would pick a race. We would profile both candidates and it was a series. So we got to sort of embed with a campaign and, you know, run around and following them to campaign stops and meetings and, um, and see it through all the way through to the end. And so that one um, was definitely a highlight, but I learned all, it was a small team. So I learned pretty much every step of the process, uh, the pre-production, the scripting and the production of it, and then also going into editing and post-production. So I got to kind of see it all and, and do it all, which was great, great experience. Wow, you know what? What what I want to ask you is because I asked this to um, one of the other interviews that I did. How do you not like get involved? Like, how do you stay detached? Because you know you're so entrenched in the information, and you really do find out every single facet of it. How do you not? Um, how do you keep it on a professional level and not get so emotional about it? It's challenging. It's really challenging. I mean, one of the, so after Fox, I wound up working for a production company in Los Angeles called Brave New Films. And we did um, a feature length documentary on gun violence. And it was, I mean, I spent hours and hours talking to people who had either experienced gun violence or had lost a family member. And, you know, I, I'd never met them, but we got so close. I felt like I knew them. They sent us, you know, all of their family photos and um, you start to feel like you know them um, on a personal level, and it's it, you have to keep reminding yourself that um, you know you're a journalist and you're not you know some as much as you might like someone or or you know you get so deeply entrenched in the story, um, but you are you know an observer, you're a third party, and you have to be objective to be able to appropriately tell that story. Um, right. so being objective really is kind of it serves it serves them, it serves you, it serves the story, it kind of you know serves everybody. Yeah, it's, I can imagine how, you know, because I know when I do my shows, I get, you know, I get involved in their lives when I hear their stories. Yes, you, know? you can't, I mean, you can't not, I mean, I still, you know, I, I still think about, you know, people I've worked with and people I've profiled and, you know, wonder kind of, you know, what they're up to and how they are. And, you know, I've, I've seen, you know, home movies of them and their kids and, right, um, right. but, you know, you have to kind of stay kind of an objective, you know you know, uh, you know, 10,000 feet above kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about um, how you found Radburn. How did you like, where did you find Radburn? So my husband's parents lived in Radburn. Um, he grew up in Ridgewood and okay. he's the oldest of four. And so I think when all the kids were out of the house, his parents were looking to kind of, you know, move on and um, they wound up finding Radburn and they were here for a couple of years. And I remember visiting when they were here and I knew, you know, I could tell how special the place was and walking the parks and, um, you know, and when we moved back from California, uh, we were living in North Bergen and we wanted somewhere we adopted our dog and we were looking for somewhere with more space, um, outdoor space in particular. And every time we kind of thought about moving, his parents would say, you know, you really should look into Radburn. Um, and they were wise because it really is the place for us. So I'm really thankful that they found Radburn and that they um, they really advocated for us looking and, and considering moving here because it's like, it's the best place to be. It is. It's Especially really, during a pandemic. Yes, yes. It's, it's you know, it's a, it's, it really is a, a family oriented community, you know, where, you know, you can reach out, the, like the old days when you can reach out to your neighbors if you need something. And, yes. And you guys look out for each other. And it really is a, a wonderful community. I, I really believe that from the bottom of my heart. How long have you lived here, Ali? About a year. We moved in the end of December 2019. Wow. And you you dove in because you help with the charities. You help with your, you know, you're on the uh, the activities committee now. You, you dive into the book club. And um, what were one of the book club, the best books that you read in the book club? I actually, I just joined the book club, I think at the end of the year. Okay. Um, and I haven't gotten to read this month, this month's book yet. Um, okay. But I love, um, you know, I'm a lifelong reader, I'm a writer. And so book clubs are very much up my alley. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's important to, um, to support where you live and support your neighbors, especially in such a neighbor oriented community. I think, you know, it's a really good 
um, thing to do, not only for the community and for the neighbors, but for yourself, especially, especially during such an isolated, um, stressful, upsetting year is to really find ways that you can sort of be of, of service. And I really think that, you know, starting local is, you know, it made the most sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. So we're excited because we have the, um, the trivia you have, um, I think there's about 15 people. Oh, that's exciting. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I can't take credit for it. A friend of mine um, loves trivia. He runs a trivia group um, for our friends. And so uh, he's going to be, you know, really helping with that. But um, but I find trivia to be um, a lot of fun. I always learn something. Um, you know, sometimes I'll know the answer to the question. And even when I don't, I'll like learn something kind of fun and be able to, you know, go back and say, did you know? Yeah. Um, and it's a good way to, you know, pass a pass a night when you, you know, are, are quarantined or, you know, can't go anywhere. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, at least it's, at least we have that, you know, at least we have the zoom where we can get together, you know, and talk to each other and face to face and eye to eye. Um, you know, it's not the same as the hugs and the, you know, the, the and the meeting with people, but at least it's a way that we can all stay connected through this really hard time. Yes. Really hard time. Um, I'm really excited because uh, what I said in the initially was um, we had a little surprise for everybody. It kind of streamed out a little bit, but uh, but you are going to help me and be my co-host on interviewing all the get to know your neighbors um, guests. So yes. I am so excited about that because, you know, I, I don't know, you know, you know, you, you don't know me very well, but um, I like to, um, you know, when you find out what people are good at and what they, what they're into and what they love, like, hey, you know, come on, I mean, join me, you know, use your experience. So I can't wait for you to, you know, to use your experience in the industry um, to interview a lot of people because, you know, sometimes it's good to have different voices, different th thought patterns, you know, um, and, and usually how I interview is I do my research prior, um, and then I kind of like ask the first question and kind of see where it goes from there, like, you know, see where what they have, like you said before, like, you know, you don't know the, the answer is going to be so I don't kind of try to stick to um, an agenda. I kind of let, you know, it go where it's got to go, but we always come back to the agenda if it kind of gets off track. And because we're video and videoing it, we can always clip it. <laughs> That's always helpful. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, um, so how, I mean, how long have you been married for Allie? Uh, we just passed two years in September. Wow. Wow. And can you share what your husband does? His name is James, right? His name is James. He actually just, um, he works full time uh, for a furniture company, but he also um, is just starting nursing school this month, which is so, oh so God. exciting. So we're both very excited for that. He's going to be a nurse. That's pretty, and, and to still want to be a nurse after the pandemic is really, it's a calling, don't you think? Oh yeah. I mean, he's thought about it for a while and now, especially after this past year, um, the world needs nurses, and I think the world needs nurses like him. He's going to be such a fantastic nurse, and um, I'm very excited for him, and I'm excited for everyone he gets to work with, and um, so it's going to be a ton of work, but um, but he's up to the task, and um, we're both very excited. How long do you have to go to school to be a nurse? Do you know? So his program is uh, two years, I think, and then uh, he'll be an RN after that. And then he's got plans to do further education, um, but he can start really working full time in the field, I think, after two years. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. And where did you guys meet? So we met through a friend of mine who went to I went to high school with her and she wound up going to college with him. And I'd heard about him for years, I think maybe since we were 19, I heard, oh, you have to meet James. You guys are really headed off. You love each other. And we didn't meet until we were in our early 20s. And um, I immediately, of course, fell like head over heels for him. And we were just friends for a long time. And um, we both wound up moving to Los Angeles for different jobs. Oh, um, that's, friends that's, in New York. that's a wink. Yes, yes. So he, um, he was out there and I wound up uh, getting a job out there. So I moved out there as well. And we started we finally started dating um, and we were together for a couple of years. And then um, I wound up getting a job offer uh, back East. And so we wound up making the decision to move back. And right before all that happened, he had proposed. So it was like very, um, 
very serendipitous, I guess. Uh, but uh, we, we've known each other, I think, for about 10 years, 11 years now. So. And you know when to ask now, how did the proposal go? Oh, it was amazing. Uh, so he, uh, we were back east visiting family. I think it was over, it was over uh, the winter holiday. So it was over Christmas. And he took me, I'm a big, um, you know, history. I, people always say history nerd, but um, I'm a big history person. And uh, I was a history minor in college. And I was very interested. I'd never been to the Tenement Museum in New York City. Uh, he always laughs when I tell this story because I'm like, it was at the Tenement Museum. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I've always been interested and I've never gone. And he wound up surprising me. He got tickets to a couple different exhibits back to back. So we went into the city um, and we went to the Tenement Museum and um, I was like, all I could talk about. And he was like, gee, why don't we go to dinner? And, um, and so we sat down and um, all of a sudden I looked up and I'm looking at the menu and I'm like, what do you think about this? And I look up and he is, he's there with the ring and he just said, you know, I love you so much. You're my best friend and Aww. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Um, and the only other people in the restaurant with us were people who had been on our tour at the museum. <laughs> and so uh, they kind of applauded and sent over champagne and we all kind of toasted together and we kind of like, you know, made new friends <laughs> through this proposal. Um, but it was just so perfect. It was like a day where he knew sort of exactly, you know, what I was into and what I wanted and, you know, wanted to experience it with me. And then at the end of the day, asked me to marry him. Wow. That's incredible. It's a true love story, right? And you knew, and you know, it's meant to be when all those connections happened, when you both went out to LA together, You're not together, but separately. And, you know, it was really meant to happen. And then, you know, the serendipity of it, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. My mom always laughs because she knew, my family knew it was going to happen. Um, um, and so they were kind of waiting. And uh, she, she, I think she texted me when we were at the restaurant and she was like, so how's it going? <laughs> and I was like, well, it's good. I think we're going to take, you know, the eight o'clock train home. And she thought like, she was like, oh my God, he didn't do it. And it was sort of right after I looked up from that that he, he proposed. But for a minute, I think everyone was like, yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, funny, what is he cracking up? <laughs> Do it now, you know? <laughs> so, um, Ali, what, what's your vision for your life? Like, I mean, I'm not saying personally, I'm saying career oriented. Like, do you want to write a book? Do you want to, what kind of books do you want to write? I mean, do you want to get back into the TV, you know, um, world? What, what are your visions for your career? Um, I mean, I've, I've been really focused um, on sort of finding my next um, project, my next gig, uh, sort of whatever it is. I mean, obviously the pandemic has really changed the landscape of so many industries and, you know, production's no different. Um, so I'm really hoping to um, find either another documentary or another, um, you know, job at a, at a news network or something in, in TV production, um, ideally. So that's been my main focus. Um, but the novel dream is still alive. Uh, I'm still writing. I think it's important to find ways to be creative. And for me, that's writing. Um, so, you know, if I could have both, that would sort of be the, the dream. Oh, you definitely can have both. You definitely can have both. So what's, have you started a novel? I've actually written one. <laughs> I've oh. written two, but um, one is not good. <laughs> yeah, but you have to start somewhere. You can't, you know, uh, you know, be perfect the first time. It's mm -hmm. kind of a time capsule. I wrote it right after I graduated college and it's just like, you can tell a 22 year old wrote it. So it's like, it's endearing, but it's not something I would probably put out into the world. So um, maybe you can go back and revise it. A little maybe bit. I wanted to just writing another one. And so I'm, you know, I'll probably go back and edit that and, um, you know, maybe see if, um, you know, I can get an agent or a publisher. Uh, so that's kind of on the, on the horizon. Or you can self-publish it and then have it published. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, because I uh, I know a lot of publishers that did that as well. And I also published a book and, and working on two others. And you don't have to wait for a publisher to grab it. Sometimes um, if you publish it yourself and it starts to have some traction or it's actually it's probably easier for them to read. And what I, what I know, I was telling a friend of mine the other day, Jack Camfield, I always remember, I follow him. And um, he, he said when he wrote his Chicken Soup for the Souls books, um, he, you know, no, everybody thought he, thought he was crazy. So he actually sent out hundreds of books to people. And he said, yeah. please, re please read this um, and give me your, your review. I like, your, you know, I want to be better. I want to. So that's really how it started to motivate and started to activate and people started to read it. 
because yeah. he he took the lead on it. So something to think about. You don't have to wait for a publisher. You could publish it yourself. So what what is, if you could give us a st small glimpse of what the story is about? I mean, what it, what's it the what's the the topic? Um, sure. So it's kind of a it's about four uh, four women who were very close friends. Um, when they were growing up as teenagers and something really, really uh, traumatic happened that kind of ruined their friendship and they all went in their separate ways. And now uh, they're in their early thirties and something happens where it motivates them. They have to come back and kind of confront the past in order to go forward. And it winds up, um, they solve a mystery, they repair their friendship. Uh, it's kind of like, um, like now and then meets the craft. There's kind of a supernatural um, right, right. component to it, but uh, that's kind of the general um, I love books about, especially female friendship. Um, and so that was on my mind a lot as I was writing it. And um, so that's- Or maybe you become a, um, a show on TV. Maybe. That would be that'd awesome. Be cool. that, would, that would roll everything together. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I always ask these silly questions because I think it's just good to know the person a little bit better. And so what is, what is your favorite type of music? Um, my favorite music. Um, I really like, there's a, there's a guy named Andrew McMahon. Uh, he's been in a couple of different bands and, um, he's around my age. He's a little older than me, but I've sort of grown up with his music and his music kind of grows up with him too. And so, um, he's kind of been my favorite for a long time, but I also really like classic rock. I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan, a huge Tom Petty fan. I love um, Tom Petty. Love Tom Petty. Yes. Me too. I got to see, I, I kick myself because I had a chance to see his last tour, uh, one of his last tours at the Hollywood Bowl, which would have been such a good show. And I didn't go. I said, yeah, I'll get him on the next time. And now he's not around anymore. And so the moral is always go see that concert that you're debating seeing. Yeah. Always do what you want. You When you got the opportunity right do in it. front of you, do it, do it. Because uh, especially this pandemic taught us that, right? A lot. Yes. So um, what about your, what, what is it, what type of food do you like to eat? Like what's your favorite dish? Mm, I think I'd have to say, I mean, anything that my grandmother cooks uh, comes first, uh, but, but also sushi, uh, James and I, my husband James and I just had a huge, uh, not huge, but we had a, a sushi feast for our New Year's Eve. Oh, good. So. Good, good. So what other, what else, your, your um, oh, what kind of movies do you like? Because I know you're um, in the industry. I like, uh, I mean, I love like a good horror movie. Uh, I love documentaries, obviously. Um, oh. My favorite movie, I think, is Goodfellas. That's been my favorite for, for years. My whole family can, you know, quote but pretty much the whole thing. Um, but, um, but I don't know if I have like a favorite genre, but I definitely have like a couple classics where, you know, it's always like my go-to movies. Right. You know what, you know what TV program I, I got hooked on is the... Um, the new Karate Kid that's out, Cobra Kai. What is that called? Oh, I haven't seen it, but I heard it's very good. It's 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 really wonderful because it has a lot of life lessons in it mm -hmm. because of the or the Japanese um, traditions. Um, so it goes back and forth, but he really, they really, it really is a very educational life lesson move, show. I really liked it. I really liked it. I'll have so, to check it out. Yeah, watch it. I suggest you do. So why, um, so what kind of, what, what leads you, because I know you were very big and you helped me a lot with the charitable um, work. What, what motivates you to, um, to, to move to help with charities? Um, I just, I mean, I think it's important. I think, you know, you always have to, it helps to put things in perspective. Um, I mean, selfishly also, it helps me if I am kind of feeling anxious or worried about something, or if I'm, you know, I've gotten down about something, it really, it makes me feel better to find ways to really, um, be of service. I mean, there are so many people that, um, just either need help or, you know, for whatever circumstance, I think, and I also think that, it's imperative for human beings to help other human beings. I think that's a big part of sort of why we're here. Um, it's important to, you know, no one can kind of be an island and just exist on their own. And I think it's important to remember that and um, to really kind of do what you can, even if it's something small, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be something little. Um, and I, but I just, I just think that that's, you know, something that everyone should kind of, 
do, whether it's, um, you know, donating to your local food bank or, um, you know, volunteering for an animal shelter or a soup kitchen or just, you know, something that, you know, we all need help. And um, I think it's important to find ways to, you know, get out of, get out of your own head and, you know, get out of yourself and, you know, see, see what you can do to make the world a little bit better. Wow. And uh, you know what, I think we need to end on that because that really, what you, how you captured who you are by the word you just said is really, you know, people will love you. You know, I know you wanted to, you wanted to get to know everybody, you know, and then this pandemic happened and you were navigating to, you know, grow more in the uh, community. Um, but you know, everybody's going to, everybody's going to gravitate towards you, you right into this community because of who you are and the, how the community is. They love families and um, it's just one big neighborhood. Um, and it is such a community of helpers and that's something that drew me to it. I mean, you know, the people that went out of their way to, to welcome us when we moved in, um, the amount of people I've met kind of just, you know, through walking a dog and I have a neighbor that makes amazing homemade bread then he'll you know drop a loaf off for us so you know it's it's a whole community of people that are looking out for each other and I think that's what makes Radburn such an amazing place yes so I can't wait because we begin to do our, our uh, hosting co-hosting pretty soon um, but till then I really want to thank you to, for allowing the community and myself to get you know to know you better um, it really is a pleasure and I hope that everybody um, reaches out to you and just shares a little bit of, uh, spread a little love, spread a little love. Yeah, it was a great, um, great opportunity. I love, you know, talking with you and as many people as I can get to know, um, you know, I'm excited to, to, to meet everybody. <laughs> so, Okay, well, we'll say goodbye and, uh, and I'll see you, I'll talk to you soon and have a wonderful and happy new year. And I hope all your dreams come true. Oh, thank you. You too. And happy new year. Bye.